Today on the panel, we're going to be diving into the access to cash review and its findings. I think it's going to be fascinating. Uh, when we consider the future of finance, it's easy to imagine a world without cash. Indeed, for most of us in the room, we probably are designing, building and running products that, in fact, have no place for cash in them, or potentially that's the way we see it. Um, but it's important to remember, uh, as so often happens when we, when we design new products, that there's always a risk that we create new pockets of exclusion or, or compound existing issues that are, already, that are already out there. Like squeezing a balloon, we fix one problem over here and create another over there. Financial exclusion, it's, it's no one thing, and that makes it all the, all the harder to deal with, uh, which is why it's so important that endeavours like the Access to Cash Review uh, exist and continue and provide that insight uh, for us in, as an industry to help foresee potential problems uh, and adapt in advance. So, uh, we've spent a lot of time as a business thinking about financial exclusion. Uh, there's, in our opinion, three, three causes or, or really an absence of three things that lead to people actually being excluded. So that's opportunity, capability and resilience, or, or you know, to be more precise, it's the lack of any one of those three things that can lead to you being excluded. Now, what's important is that we as an industry potentially talk about people lacking opportunity, lacking capability, lacking resilience, but consumers don't think of it that way. When you lack opportunity, actually your life is harder and it's more expensive. When you lack capability, it's more confusing. And when you lack resilience, it's just a little bit more stressful. So my hope is that through the panel today, we're all going to get a, a much better understanding of where cash fits into the lives of consumers and the future of financial services as a whole. And, and we as an industry learn how to make sure the products that we're developing make life less hard, less expensive, less confusing, uh, and a little less stressful. So uh, the panel today, we've got Manika Kalia, co-founder of Neighbour, Lucy Malinchuk, senior policy manager at Age UK, and Natalie Sini, who is the chair of the Access to Cash Review and also the chair of Innovate Finance. So nicely starting, Natalie, I think with you. Could you give us all just a little insight into the Access to Cash Review? So the Access to Cash Review um, started a year ago and we published uh, last month. And we were commissioned in the, against the backdrop of Britain fast going to a less cash society. So for example, if we step back a decade, six out of every 10 transactions were in cash. Last year, it had gone down to just over three in term, with lots of forecasts suggesting it could be down to one in term. And the exam question we were asked was, um, is Britain ready to go cashless? And if not, what do we do to stop people being left behind? We published our conclusions a month ago. In summary, we concluded that Britain is going fast towards less cash. But the risk is, if we sleepwalk there, we will leave millions of people behind. And we sized the population who would really struggle to live in a cashless society, and that's not by choice but by necessity, just under 20% of the population. And our recommendations in a nutshell were that we need a two-fold approach in Britain. One hand um, to work very, very hard to include that just under 20% of the population so that everyone truly has a choice um, to go digital. But in the meantime, we do need to keep cash viable or we'll leave a lot of people behind. Perfect. Thanks very much. Great review. Um, so, Lucy, I think this is an interesting one for you. So, it could be a little hard for us in this room to understand the potential issues that people might face from uh, a world that is cashless. Could you give us some, some real-world examples? Luckily, this is not a difficult uh, a question for me. Although in my daily life, I'd probably be the same. So, if I just go about my normal business, I wouldn't actually meet anyone in my friends and neighbours. I wouldn't be aware that they would have difficulties if we had less cash or if cash was harder to, to access. But I get already get letters and telephone calls and interestingly even emails uh, from people who talk about how important their access to cash is and the problems that they face when it's difficult for them to get it. So we see it hitting our network in a number of different places. For example, we might see local age UKs who have a home shopping service. So that would be a service for someone who might struggle to do their shopping themselves, who would get on a bus and go. But they can't actually pay for the bus or the service. And this is a payment to a charity who's going to do everything they can to help you to, to make that payment. They, they still can't actually do that. Um, it could be someone who needs to pay neighbours back. That's quite difficult to do still, especially if your neighbours are also older and not connected to all of the clever things that, it, that exist now. Um, it's, it's something that's happening already. And if we look and ask people, we'll see it. And the consequences um, 
we can also see already, and they've actually been talked about for quite a long time, they, they often crop up in the debates we have around third-party access. So I think this is where you'll see most of the evidence of this so far. And if you want some great videos, you can, I mean, even the regulators got them on the uh, Financial Conduct Authority's website in its ageing population section. There's a report on, th on coping mechanisms under third-party access, and there are some videos with people who are struggling to manage their money themselves. And that talks around some of the... I mean, they're cool coping mechanisms, but they're often quite risky coping strategies that people are using where they can't access cash themselves. That's what you've got. And, and can I come in? So, we, and we all know that the large, a large population who will struggle are the old, but what our research also found is it, it's much broader than that. So we did some work with the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, um, who highlighted that for quite a significant portion of the UK who have um, an intermittent but long-term mental health issue, a lot of people won't trust themselves to go digital because when they're in the throes of a period of depression or a manic episode, they can just empty their bank account. Um, and we also heard from um, charities who help people with debt that the biggest reason why people depend on cash is actually poverty. So UK finance figures show that if you earn less than £10,000 a year, you're 14 times more likely to be dependent on cash than if you earn over £30,000 a year. And the reason for that is very simple. If you've only got £50 to last a week, if you've got it in your pocket in cash, you can only spend £50. Whereas if you rely on a card, money might come out when you're not quite expecting it, you might inadvertently over go overdrawn. And it's a, a, a reason why a lot of debt charities still say cut up your cards. Nasty, perhaps for you, is, is there evidence backing up that, that going cashless is really going to leave these people behind? Or is, is, is it just something that change will happen and people will, will have to roll with it? I think there's already evidence it will leave people behind. And, and the reason for that is, as we go more and more digital, the cash economics don't work. So it's not a case of we go digital, but there's still ATMs and there's still branches and shops still take cash. We've seen over many years um, branches um, disappear. Um, we are starting to see ATMs close for the first time really in a decade. And some of the most dependent communities on cash are rural communities. That's where they're seeing the branch closures. That's where they're seeing the ATM closures. We also heard from small businesses that the reason a lot of them are starting to consider going cashless, and this is exactly what's happened in Sweden, is because they used to pop out at lunchtime to bank the cash. Now they have to drive for an hour and a half to the branch because it's moved, and the costs of banking cash are going up. So, mm, you know what, just go cashless. So we're already starting to see communities who just can't get cash and who might not be able to spend cash. Um, and we've anecdotally heard a lot of evidence, and we heard it during, during the report, of, for example, people trying to pay their tax bill. HMRC won't accept cash anymore. They need a relative to do it. So we are starting to see people lose their independence and potentially communities left, left behind. Importantly, though, we concluded we're not seeing the crisis yet, but if we don't take action now, we're only a couple of years off. And as part of our report, we went to, to see what's happening in Sweden, where they are a few years ahead of us. They've gone so far now that an, uh, an all-party report recommended they put the brakes on because they have left people behind. And they hit their crisis about 18 months ago when their equivalent, the NHS, declared it was going cashless. And the 15% of the population who there are dependent on cash said, but we just won't be able to cope. So they've slammed the brakes on. And their big message to us was plan now before you get into a mess. That's fascinating. H how have they put the brakes on that? Right, so um, they called an all-party commission. Um, and what they've... For a start, their regulators were a bit asleep at the wheel and have been quite open about that. So they didn't have an equivalent to the FCA looking at this, and their central bank wasn't really worrying about it. Their central bank is now really worrying about it. They've instigated a guarantee of access to cash, which means that in an area where there aren't ATMs, they'll look for local shops to give cash back or various other means so that everyone can get cash. The thorny issue there that they're still grappling with is is how they make sure shops will still accept cash. They've similarly gone for a guarantee um, of SMEs being able to deposit cash because they've taken the view, and to be honest, we came to the same conclusion, that legislating to require every shop to take cash felt a bit draconian, but making it easy for everyone to bank cash 
um, was probably the biggest lever you could do to make sure retailers will still accept cash. So they've equally made it easier, and they will be putting back services to make sure everyone keep, can keep cash. Amongst the more interesting things they've done in Sweden, they've actually leafleted every member of the Swedish population in a leaflet that looks a bit like the sort of nuclear leaflets we used to get in the 70s, that, amongst other things, recommends that everyone keeps cash under their bed. Um, and that was after a, a debate in Swedish Parliament uh, that said, well, what do we do when we're hacked by the Russians? So, and, and the Riksbank have even debated reissuing... Do you remember those um, machines you used to have where you put your card on it and you put a piece of paper and retailers went like that? I can't remember what they're called. They actually debated reissuing them to every retailer in Sweden for when the system goes down. So they're doing a whole range of measures um, because, frankly, they've lost their infrastructure now. Wow. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Um, Lucy, I think maybe for, for you, what, what's the balance needed between keeping cash viable and including everyone in digital payments? I, I would probably want to reframe the question. I don't think we should be trying to balance the two. I think we need to start from the point that payments are essential services. Um, it's, it, it's amazing, I think, that really AGK is interested in payments, lots of people are surprised, but it's because people really care about payments and over years and years we get letters from people when they struggle to pay because of changes that have happened, you know, when DWP changes its payment systems. It's, it's something that people care about because you cannot live independently in your own home and manage your own money unless you can make payments yourself. And that's not, it's really important that we don't then just focus on the point of sale, which is what often happens. So it's not just having something which works really well at the point of the transaction, but it's all the stuff that sits behind that. So can I load the product? Can I manage the product? Can I view the product? So it, it has to be the whole chain that works. So, I mean, I would just do both. You know, I just think we should do both. We, we should go full tilt, absolutely, on trying to develop new payment solutions that meet the needs of everybody. But until we have those solutions, whether that's one enormous shining solution, which seems very unlikely, or a, or a whole range of different options, then we can't lose cash. And I think we can look back to what happens with what I um, sort of now called the check debacle where we talked about <laughs> we talked about removing checks and we sort of promised people that there'd be something that would replace them but that and i think people really meant it you know no, no one was actually trying to take something away before before they put the new thing in place but it was not convincing and we talked about taking taking away the the clearing system before we had any real plans about what would replace it before we really even understood properly what people valued in that old system. So I, mean, I think, I hope we're already way ahead now and that we have started to look and understand more about what is so important to people in cash, why other existing methods aren't meeting those needs. Um, but we should go full tilt and we can't give up cash until we've actually, actually solved it. Okay. Uh, I guess for the whole panel, actually, I, I'm interested to know, is a cashless society ever likely to be viable or are we just going less cash rather than cashless? I mean, I think with the report, what was fairly clear was that we were sort of sleepwalking um, into a situation where cash usage was going to rapidly decline over the next few years. And I think the broad consensus was it was going to decline but not disappear entirely, and therefore making sure that there was an ordinary process as we walked through that was actually quite important. Um, so I don't think anyone really thought it was going to disappear in the next five plus years, but actually the pace of decline is something that really needs to be managed. And I mean, one of the interesting things that I found during the review was some of the new questions that came up. So one of, one of the insights I got from Sweden was actually what are some of the consequences of being entirely cashless? So one of the, the advantages that cash has is it doesn't require electricity to work. Um, it, it, it's resilient if you're hacked as a nation. Um, you've got some control over it. Um, so some of the questions that Sweden's looking at um, through the Riksbank around, well, actually, do we ever want to be completely dependent on digital? How, how, how are digital networks sufficiently resilient? How are they built this, to the same standard um, that we require utilities to be built to? So I, I think that's... To, to Monica's point about sleepwalking into a cashless society, we've also got some pretty fundamental questions to ask about the resilience of digital and 
another question asked by the Rix Bank was, um, have we just privatised our money supply? So there's some big questions to ask before, as a policy choice, we go digital. We mustn't just do it by default. And I would say it's really important we, we do do it as a policy decision because I don't think that... I mean, I'm, not, I'm certainly not sure that consumers are going to, in a way, demand that cash stays. I'm not sure how effective consumer demand is going to be in that, in that sense. We often talk about how the changes in banking are led by consumer demand, and that's why we're losing our branches, and that's why we're reducing access. But I think it's probably a slightly more complex picture, and I also think that the people relying on cash might not be that strong in terms of their demand. So I don't think that we can rely on just a kind of supply and demand model to manage that, that decline. So it really is important that we... Um, that we consider it as a, as a national policy question. Thanks, perfect. I, I should point out for the audience, we've got a load of questions here, but, but we're really keen on hearing your questions as well. So if you're on the app, uh, we've got the, the iPad here, just send your questions up and we'll ask them as they, as they come up. Um, Monica, is this, you know, as, a, as a FinTech founder yourself, mm -hmm. is this an education challenge or is this a product development uh, challenge? Um, I think it's quite complex, and I think it's a combination of infrastructure. I think it's a combination of product development um, to address the needs of those that could be potentially left behind. Um, and then I think education is important as well. Um, so I guess just kind of touching on all of those three things in turn. Um, on the infrastructure point, you know, it's great if you've got, you know, um, the ability to do mobile payments. And I think maybe the assumption these days is that, hey, everybody's got a smartphone, so actually it's going to be really easy. Um, and what the report um, found was actually, you know, if you take, for example, rural farming communities, 90% of farmers have a phone, but actually 60% have a smartphone, and actually only 30% have access to good quality broadband. And so therefore, it may be that you could be excluded just because where you live in the country and whilst there is kind of you know a government approach to try and ensure that you have a, a high quality broadband access I think we're still quite far away from that and therefore infrastructure ne really needs to catch up if we're really going to be able to um, move towards a cashless society um, so I think that part is really important um, on the product development side, I think that it's really about um, coming up with innovative solutions that can really support the needs of some of the groups that we've already touched on. So what Lucy was referring to in terms of um, um, the elderly and also um, in relation to people that maybe have mental health issues, teenagers, you know, teenagers with special needs. I mean, there are a whole range of different groups that would, you know, not necessarily have... Uh, their needs addressed and therefore you do need products that are innovative to address those needs. Um, I guess also um, in other countries that have gone more aggressively towards a cashless society, some of those product solutions, so for example, things like peer-to-peer -peer payments, they do exist, um, but they haven't really taken off in the UK. And so I think the thing is, is that it may not be that the innovation is, it, maybe the innovation is there, but actually the adoption hasn't come across for whatever reason. So I think that's where, you know, you need the innovation, but you also need um, to actually really drive adoption. Um, and then I guess the final point is really around um, education and I guess, you know, we're both quite kind of similar in terms of our sort of uh, focus here, which is the idea that actually in the UK, baseline financial literacy and financial capability is actually quite low. Um, and, you know, where Natalie mentioned the idea that actually... Um, people that are on low incomes, generally speaking, are maybe more reliant on cash, it's also the case that those pockets of society are also less financially savvy. Um, we don't do a good job of teaching um, about education, um, you know, in schools in the UK. Um, and certainly from a neighbour perspective, we're very focused on improving baseline financial capability um, through financial education. So I think it's really quite complex and you do need all of those three things to come together so actually people are more equipped to go digital over the next few years. I'd, I'd also like to add, if, if I could, I'd like to encourage people, where, whenever we feel the need to drive adoption, I think we should just check that what we're driving people to adopt really works for them. Uh, and, I, and I think uh, there have been quite a few examples historically. So I'm, one example might be power of attorney, to take an example in a slightly different 
setting. For ages, we've been trying to drive people to sign up for powers of attorney. We know everyone should have them. I should have one. I haven't done it. Um, you know, they're, they're a good thing to have. Uh, and we tend to say, if only we had a better campaign to convince people of why they're so good, then everyone would have them. Um, but actually, that's absolutely not true. There are lots of people who shouldn't have them because they don't have anyone they can trust. Then this product isn't suitable for those people. There are other reasons why the product isn't suitable for people. And when we've done payments education campaigns in the past, we've tended to assume that we have something that already works for everyone instead of challenging ourselves um, to make sure that there aren't really good reasons why people are, are not using those payment methods. So absolutely, uh, if you design something great and don't tell people about it, it's, it's never going to, to work. But we just have to make sure that we are challenging ourselves, that we have really checked properly with these excluded groups. Brilliant. Natalie, it's... Um so, speaking from personal experience, uh, we have a financial inclusion fintech proposition that doesn't feature cash anywhere in it. Um, what is stopping fintech and financial services from meeting these needs now? It's a very good question. I think there's, there's a mult multiple set of answers. One is, it, it, I mean, Monica mentioned in some countries they've cracked some issues. Um, Sweden and peer-to-peer -peer lending is actually a very, very good example. So in Sweden, low-value transactions are um, easily done peer-to-peer. Um, -peer. Uh, they've tackled some charity donation issues with QR codes um, in a way that we haven't in Britain. Why? Actually, because the four biggest banks in Sweden worked together to create a common solution that was commonly branded so that it was very easy to be adopted. Now, we've got the tech in Britain, but we haven't done that sort of common branded, common platform. And we have a tendency in Britain to come up with the answers, but call them slightly different things by institution. Now, if you're a low adoption, vulnerable segment, unless something is really clear, pretty much across all the banks and described in a similar way, the chances you're all going to adopt it is pretty low. So, so there's, there's some structural things we, we ought to do differently. I think the other thing is cash hasn't been seen as sexy. So, um, you know, why innovate in cash when it's going to die? And, I, and I'm hoping one of the consequences of our report is cash isn't going to die. Boy, could we do with innovation in it. So at the moment, um, the, the best innovation we've got in cash access is the ATM, which dates back to 1965. They've, they've got to be smarter ways. I mean, what about local cash back, which doesn't really exist in Britain? We could innovate in cash and improve cash access for rural communities in a way that doesn't cost as much as the ATM network. Um, we could innovate to allow SMEs to pay in their cash. Um, I know I pay, f I use my dry cleaning through an app. I work out when I can drop it off and someone appears at a time that suits me. And yet we haven't developed something like that for SMEs who want to bank. Instead, they have to drive for two hours to a local bank branch and queue. So we could be smarter about innovating in cash and not just innovating in digital. And I think the third thing I'd say is we do need to specifically address needs. And that's sort of the point both Monica and Lucy have made. A good analogy would actually be what Transport for London did when they took cash away from the buses. So they had the big problem of they didn't want a conductor standing taking cash because it meant two people on buses. And if one person took the cash, buses ran slow. So they had a real business need and customer need to get rid of cash on the buses. And they worked for 40 years on it. And what they did is systematically understood why people needed cash. And then they chunked off the next need, the next need, the next need, the next need, till they got down to 0.2% of the population used cash. And then they trained every bus driver on vulnerability. And I think we need a similar approach to not just hope that we're developing for, the majority, for, for everybody, but say, okay, who's left behind? Now let's develop a solution for them and let's do it across the whole sector. Probably started by FinTech, because that's where a lot of the ideas are, but hopefully picked up by the incumbents and the mainstream banks and made ubiquitous. And then I think we've got a good chance of tackling it. Brilliant, thanks. Um, you, you speak, maybe this is one for the whole panel. Is there one killer hack that's going to solve this? Or, or, or is it uh, lots and lots of different issues to be resolved um, and we're all going to have to come together collaboratively to do it? Um, unfortunately, I don't think there is one killer hack. Um, I think the things that we've touched on already, which is broadband access and also the peer-to-peer -peer side, could actually see a seismic shift in terms of cash usage. But I think, actually, it's really just an amalgamation of different things, um, both in terms of you know, regulation and also product innovation um, that are going to basically support the journey. Um, so, yeah, um, I, we don't, I don't think the panel in general think there's, a, there's one quick fix. 
sadly, no. I think the, the big next step in developing whatever the closest thing to a quick fix is going to be is understanding, as Natalie said, understanding those segments that haven't chosen to switch to some of the great things that exist already. I think the other thing I'd say positively, quite genuinely as a panel, there wasn't a single need we saw that between us we couldn't think of how to design a solution. Um, and we couldn't, everything we saw that, that where cash was meeting a need at the moment, better than digital, we could see tech out there that could solve it. So this is a very solvable problem. And um, just to build on what my colleagues have said, I mean, if you look outside Britain, China's really interesting in the payment space because they've got such low levels of literacy across much of the population. They've leapfrogged a lot of our banking. Biometrics is, is actually incredibly inclusive. You don't need to be literate. You just need to be able to smile. Um, so there, there's lots of tech which could solve the problem. The issue I think we've got is more systematically working through the problem and working together as an industry, not the technology. Okay. What, what role do the incumbents play in that, or maybe the regulator as well? Um, quite a big role. <laughs> so uh, an awful lot of these ideas are, are out there somewhere technologically. The issue is they're not sufficiently prevalent and they're not offered in mainstream banking. So a lot of the populations we've talked about are the least likely to be early adopters of fintech. They probably haven't heard of most of the names of people sitting in the room. They'll bank within an incumbent, and they'll need something to be quite simple. Um, so what we'll need is, I really do think the innovation will come from fintech, but we need the incumbents to go, you know what, that's a good idea, and roll it out. I mean, there are signs that this could happen. I think recently of the example where Monzo came up with the, the gambling um, blockage. On, on their app, and very quickly Barclays picked it up, and then UK Finance picked it up, and now most mainstream banks are thinking about it. But we need that same attitude for all of these, these issues. In terms of regulation, what I constantly heard from the banks when I talked to them about, about this, this work was the fear from a competition law perspective of all getting in the room together to talk about how to solve things. So what we need from regulators is the focus on solving these needs, but also the cover to get the whole of the industry in a room to say, come on, let's solve this issue together. Because I don't think they'll do it on their own. I'm going to, I feel that with quite a lot of positivity in, uh, in, one, in one session. I would say that the, some of the solutions for some of the customer needs have been around for a really long time. And, uh, and so not, this isn't necessarily a cash solution, but for example, the idea that you could have a second card on your account that you could give to somebody else and they could use it freely. So you can have an unnamed uh, carer who can access cash or make payments for you, um, particularly now with the ability to turn off to tightly control what those payments could be. That's a phenomenal solution for a really hard to reach group of people. I think most of the incumbent banks have the technology to offer this. They know that the need exists, they know the solution exists, and it just hasn't got to the top of the list of things, presumably because the group of customers who need it aren't viewed as, as deeply profitable at the moment. And so I think this question of attitude, you know, I want to be really challenging. Payments are essential services. We have to find a way to provide them to everybody. And so that is a role for regulator and possibly government also to say if it doesn't come up organically from the industry in some way, if there isn't, if there isn't a way for us to develop this as an industry, then there will need to be some kind of requirement to find a solution or we'll see an increase in fraud, an increase in financial abuse and an increase in people who can't live on their, on their own. Yeah, I would actually just think. I would just echo what Lucy said. Um, we've seen this before in relation to current accounts, for example, uh, where you know incumbent banks maybe maybe sometimes step back from provision because they're not the most profitable customers, and that's the kind of scenario where, um, in relation to creating solutions that support people that are more vulnerable, um, you do need to have some type of government intervention and regulation. Um, and I think you know the innovation is going to come probably from the fintechs, uh, but we've actually seen some interesting kind of hackathon approaches by. The the kind of big banks and I think really just fostering an environment of actual um, innovation and creativity uh, with I guess some government kind of you know uh, gentle suasion or even potentially regulation to actually encourage people to actually come up with a solution even if it doesn't make money um, for some of these groups is going to be really important. Do you, do you see a future for credit unions in bridging this gap? I would have to say um, 
there is an opportunity. Um, I don't think that there is necessarily an opportunity specifically for credit unions. I think they do serve large swathes of the community um, because of their community roots, and particularly in rural communities, I think they are well placed to try and do something to address the issue. I think the challenge probably historically has been that credit unions have not necessarily had um, a very um, forward-thinking approach in terms of innovation, although I don't want to generalise. Um, so I think they are well-placed, and I think that maybe some type of collaboration between, say, fintechs and credit unions could come up to solve the problem. Um, so I think they have the right relationships and customer footprint, um, but maybe ne not necessarily have adopted have been able to adopt from a technology and innovation point of view in the past. Okay. Nothing to add on that, fine. Um, so you're talking to a room of financial services professionals uh, in the fintech space. What would be your, your kind of key directions or, or key takeaways for those people to leave here when thinking about cash uh, as a payment medium in the UK? All right, let me have a go. Um, the whole of the UK doesn't look like us. So I know, I know it's obvious to say, but I started this review, I don't use cash apart from when I go back home to my village in Kent which has no mobile signal, therefore I have to. But I don't when I'm in London, which is um, during the week. But actually the population doesn't look like us. Um, and I, I think remembering that we aren't, the 100% of the population is key. I think the other thing I'd say is cash isn't dead. There's huge scope for fintechs to innovate in cash. And seriously, there is huge scope because very little innovation has happened for a very long time. So look at it as, as an opportunity. Um, and thirdly, as we develop digital payments, until we can get everybody into digital payments, we've got a five billion cost a year um, in running the cash infrastructure in Britain. So there's actually a big incentive for the industry of let's try and get everyone to have a choice. Um, I, I think it's to think about the reasons why people like cash. So we often approach it quite negatively, but I think if we understand and look at why are people still choosing to use this ancient, ancient payment method instead of these other cool things, then, then there's a lot that we can, can learn from that. And it's important also to remember that these people who are choosing to use the ancient, old-fashioned payment method are not necessarily stupid. They're not doing it just because they're not online or they're, they're not doing it just because they're resistant to new things. There are some really positive reasons why people like cash. And so understanding those, I think, could help us design even better solutions um, for, the, for the people who are already using some digital payments. Brilliant. Um, actually, Lucy, let's talk, talk on those points you just made there. So cash is not a frictionless payment mechanism. Um, and we often talk about frictionless payment as being the future of how, of how payment should be. Is there an argument that friction or introducing friction into digital payments might be a good thing for those consumers who are used to, to working with cash? Yeah, I mean, not all friction is created equal, is it? Right. I mean, <laughs> I think that's a key thing. It's absolutely not binary. So is it good that I can make, uh, you know, I can spend all of, I can transfer all of the money I have to buy my house very, very easily whilst I'm being distracted by lots of other things. Is that good? No, that's absolutely dreadful. Like, I should not have done it, and I felt awful while I did it. Um, you know, so, so that, there is definitely not all created equal. I don't think consumers really want it all the time. If you, if you ask me if I want free stuff, I'll generally say yes. It doesn't mean it's actually my priority. You know, most of the, the research that we do where we ask people about do they want less friction, of course they're going to say they want less friction because that's the way we've set up that kind of, kind of research. So yeah, I, I just totally agree. S some friction, yes. It doesn't mean we can't still have contactless. Um, there are some groups campaigning for more friction. So the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute is a good example. Their argument is that frictionless payments for those with long-term mental health issues is absolutely the worst thing you can do because it allows people to blow their entire savings. So their campaign, a bit like Monzo's gambling app, is for people to voluntarily sign up for more friction so that if their spending goes awry or something odd happens, there is a block put in with a prompt that says, are you sure, or a friend is called or an account is shut down until you call back. Um, so there are situations when people want more friction. And I think it's, it's, it's Lucy's earlier point, actually. Let's understand the reasons why people see cash 
in some situations is better than digital because there'll be a reason and actually for some of those reasons it is friction hmm. now positively we can introduce that into digital payments quite easily but let's not assume everyone is like us not everyone wants frictionless payments different people have different needs brilliant, brilliant. okay um i think perhaps last question then uh is there really a role for, for fintech as a whole to innovate in cash specifically? Yes. yes. <laughs> I mean, if, if, a bit of a revelation for me, and I, I, I started um, this review knowing very little about how cash worked. We spend five billion pounds a year in the UK on the cash infrastructure, and when you start looking at it, it looks like it was designed 60 years ago because largely it was designed 60 years ago. And we haven't had much innovation in it. And that's every point from, you know, bulk cash sorting centres through to the distribution of cash, access to cash, SME deposit of cash. There's a lot of money there. There's a hell of a lot of duplication and there's not a lot of innovation. And I think most fintechs haven't got into it because we've assumed it's dying. It's not. Um, so actually, I think it's a massive market opportunity to really innovate in cash, which will help consumers, help small businesses, help take cost out help keep cash alive while we get everybody to digital? I think yes, and I think it's also a clue as to where else we could go. So actually, so I look at not just financial services, but also um, consumer and utilities more generally. And essentially, we often see this great cocktail. We've got an aging infrastructure and some continuing consumer need. And this isn't the only, this isn't the only aging piece of infrastructure that we've got that was probably designed a long time ago that we're kind of ignoring and hoping that it falls over so badly that something else will just have to happen. Um, so yes, definitely innovation in cash. And I think there are loads more opportunities uh, in, in similar analogous situations that, that we could look at too. Yeah, I think I'd just echo um, what Natalie and Lucy said. So, you know, um, I think it's fairly astonishing how archaic some of the approaches are in terms of cash usage. And so it's really crying out for innovation. Um, and I think the report really kind of points to some of the potential solutions. But, you know, they're definitely not, um, you know, um, fully comprehensive. And I think this is the opportunity to really sort of think out of the box and to innovate, bring incumbents together with fintechs and just, you know, think about how things could be done differently. Fantastic. Well, I think that's, that's the main takeaway for today. Cash is not dead, it's not going away, uh, and there's a huge opportunity for, for all of us perhaps to innovate in that space. Um, that's it for this panel. So thank you very much to Natalie, to Lucy, and to Monica. Um, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. The Access to Cash Review, you can find it online. Um, I would stress, please go and have a look at it. It is really, really interesting, um, and there's a lot of interesting stuff to, to be pulled out of that for, for all of us, I think. So thank you very much. <laughs>